Hey everybody, I've got an epic one today, and I am serious. Mark Elias, the lead Democratic election lawyer, gives us the scoop on the 59 or possibly 60 now post-election cases that the Trump legal team lost. And I got to tell you, there is some pretty hilarious stuff in here, especially uh, about Rudy Giuliani's spectacular uh, incompetence in the courtroom. But as funny as this stuff is, it's also really tragic uh, because Republicans have undermined their base's faith in democracy. And as I say in our conversation, I don't think we can get the toothpaste back in the tube. Um, it's funny. Mark doesn't blame Trump as much as he blames the Republicans. He's just basically, he's saying, you know, Trump is, is just sick. But, you know, the Republicans have refused, and, and some of them still refuse to acknowledge that, that Biden won and is our next president, the 126 uh, Republican House members who signed on to the amicus brief in that just absurd Supreme Court suit that tried to throw out the results of the elections in four other states. Anyway, this is Mark's fourth time on the podcast, and it all culminates with this. There's an old saying in life and in every profession, you win some, you lose some. And in the uh, post-election Republican lawsuits, you won 59 and lost one? So far, yeah. Yeah, there's a, 60th, <laughs> there's a, there's a 60th out there in New Mexico that I think, uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident that uh, Donald Trump will lose, <laughs> which is good because, you know, every night I post a, uh, a tweet and it always says, you know, Donald Trump, uh, and his allies began the day one end, you know, 58, one of 59, whatever it is. And then the next line is Donald Trump ended the day one end, you know, 50, <laughs> you know whatever it is. And then I say good night. And so I got to one, I got to one, uh, one win and 59 losses. And a number of people were very upset because they're like, when are you going to get to 60? When are you going to get to 60? And, and, and my fear was that, or not fear, but, but it, it seemed clear that we were not going to get there because there were no more lawsuits for them to lose. But lo and behold, uh, <laughs> Donald Trump's campaign then filed a lawsuit in New Mexico uh, after the electors had met, which is a new new twist on things. Um, so when they lose There's that- There's a lot of new twists. <laughs> so when they lose that, it will be 60. <laughs> Well, since it's one, it'll be one and sixty. Then let's talk about uh, the one you lost. And it, I, I'm guessing it must have been a doozy. They must have proven some kind of massive fraud and something. No, <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> no. Well, tell them what their big victory was. Yeah. So, so I'm glad you asked this because people got very nervous when I said they won a case, and people were trying to say, "Well, geez, you know." What does this mean? So the one case they won involved the following fact pattern. So in Pennsylvania, as in many places, when you vote absentee, there are a number of hoops that you have to jump through to get your ballot counted. And if you don't jump through all of them perfectly, then there is a period after the election in which you can cure the deficiency. So, so if you fail to do something right on your absentee ballot, you basically have a grace period after the election um, uh, to correct that. So one of the issues that comes up is if you are a first time voter by mail and you did not show ID and you are also have registered by mail. So you registered by mail, you voted by mail and you have not uh, submitted ID, uh, which can be like a utility bill or whatever, uh, then you had to cure that ballot or else it wouldn't count. And the state of Pennsylvania took the position that voters had nine days after the election uh, to cure uh, by presenting that ID. Uh, and the Trump campaign sued uh, and prevailed in shortening that to six days. So the law uh, in Pennsylvania then became that you had six days, not nine days post-election to, um, to cure um, 
your your ballot. I think I think it may. Have, I, I kept saying it affected. I kept saying it affected hundreds of votes. And then I said it dozens of votes. It may actually not have affected any votes. I've had some reporters because because honestly, the subset of voter who is at issue here is someone who registered by mail for the first time, voted by mail for the first time, and then got their ID in <laughs> after six days, but before nine days. That's the, that's the, that's the, that's, that's the victory they had. <laughs> that's their one out of 60 thus far. That's the victory. So the idea that, well, we had a victory. <laughs> that, and, then, and then on the other side, they still keep insisting, or at least Trump keeps insisting, and 75% of Republican voters now believe that this was fixed. <laughs> um, there's so much here. Let me ask you something. So in uh, how, how many of these were you actually arguing the case? How many were you in court arguing the case? You couldn't have done all 60. No. Be, so, so many of these were the same day. Yeah. So, so <laughs> you know, a, a number of these actually didn't involve court hearings because the court would get the pleadings and the court would dismiss them. <laughs> there were a few that the, that the plaintiffs, the Trump campaign or others filed, and then we responded and then they withdrew their lawsuit. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of wow. Do those counts as losses? I counted those as losses. Look, so here oh, were my, well, were few, hey. hold on. So there were a few rules I had okay? and, and they cut both ways. The first is that um, a lawsuit so they got a win for their lawsuit, even if it wasn't consequential, because it was a win. We counted as a loss if either a court ruled against them or they dismissed voluntarily. We did not count as wins, though, the lawsuits that were filed by pro se individuals. So if a individual- You didn't count as wins for you. We did not count them as wins for us. Right. Okay. We did not count if, if it was a- lawsuit by an individual, you know, trying to help Donald Trump and they didn't have a lawyer. We felt like it wasn't fair to count that as a loss for Trump not. or a win for us. So we had to draw some lines about like, where do you cut the, you know, a lawsuit that counts against Trump and his allies, which is, I always say Trump and his allies. And that those were the lines we drew. We also, though, only counted any case as having one win or loss. So if Donald Trump filed the lawsuit in the trial court and lost, and then appealed and lost, and then appealed to the Supreme Court and lost, we only counted that as one loss. So oh, we didn't okay. we didn't proliferate losses. <laughs> okay, uh, were you in? The, you weren't in the court where they were claiming that their people weren't allowed in the room when the votes were being counted, and the judge kept asking, "Well, are you saying there were no?" Republic, no Trump people there, and a, a, or were there pe were <laughs> there any Trump people there? And the lawyer finally said that the number of Trump people there was a non-zero number. Correct. <laughs> yeah, I was not. No, I was not. <laughs> I, I was not there for the non-zero number uh, statement, where the lawyer was clearly trying to balance between not saying there were people, but not saying there were people, <laughs> you know, for, for a, a, and the judge, and, and a number of judges did this, like really pin down the lawyers and saying, are you saying X? And are you saying Y? And the lawyers were, of course, in very difficult positions because they, they had a ethical obligation to, candid, <laughs> to be candid with the judge. On the other hand, um, they were trying to toe the line of what their client was saying. Now, I noticed that the judge, when he said there were non-zero number of Trump people there, and the judge went right to, so so there was no one there. I mean, so there were there there were people there. There were Trump people there. Yeah, well, you couldn't and have a just negative went on. person, right? So if it's a non-zero, right, that leaves <laughs> open two possibilities. It's either negative people or it's positive people. And, and you know, obviously you couldn't, have a, you couldn't have a negative number of people there. Right. Um, so there were. Not but here's wrong. my question. Yeah. How much discretion does a judge have? Because if I were the judge and he said that the, the number of Trump people there was a non-zero number, I would go, wait a minute. Did you just say <laughs> there was a non-zero number? And, but he didn't. The judge didn't. He just went, he went on with his business. But do judges sometimes point out st absurdities? Do they, they, do they get angry? At so they sometimes do. But in a case like this, in post-election cases, the judges really try to bend over backwards to give not just the 
actual fair process to the complainant. But they feel very, very important that the process instill confidence in the public that it was fair. So you tend to see judges, I won't want to say pull their punches, but they, they tend to extend every opportunity and every courtesy to the people making these claims because they want the end process or the end result to instill confidence in the public that the judge was not after, you know, was not out to get anyone and that the judge really was giving everyone their fair their fair opportunity to be heard. And so sometimes it's quite frustrating. You know, I'll, I'll get, people will say, you know, how come the judge didn't throw it out here or the judge, you know, dignified this or didn't sanction, you know, one of the questions is, you know, how come, how come the judges are not sanctioning the lawyers? And, you know, I, in a post-election circumstance, the judge, most judges have an instinct to really make a record that every opportunity was afforded for someone to come forward with a claim. Um, and not to cut that off. How, how many of these were you arguing? Or did you actually argue yourself? I mean, you supervise basically the the thing, right? I was more supervising than I was arguing, though there were there were some that I handled myself. But it was most of the cases were argued by other lawyers. I did more supervising than I did arguing. Mm -hmm. Just give us some highlights from uh, the dumb cases. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know that I want to call them highlights. I think that they're actually, I think that, you know, and I want to state this clearly, and I know you agree with this, that it's comical in a sense, but it's our democracy. And the fact that the oh, yeah. president of the United Tragic. States was trafficking in these lies and had lawyers going about, you know, holding press conferences at the Four Season Landscaping Company when undoubtedly they thought they were going to the Four Seasons Hotel, you know, is both comical, um, but it's also tragic because, as you point out, a large number of Republicans now believe that nonsense. Oh, it's undermined the faith, uh, Americans' faith in our democracy, which is tragic. Right. So, you know, you can start with the fact that the original set of lawsuits that the Trump campaign post-election seemed to put stock in, which... <laughs> which seemed to lead to a variety of law, law firms withdrawing from representing the Trump campaign, <laughs> were, were aimed at suggesting that there was fraud because Republican observers were not given close enough access to witness the ballot counting process. Now, the video of these situations in Pennsylvania and Michigan and elsewhere, you know, show that actually that wasn't true, right? Like you could actually see people watching and observing, but that was for- A non-zero number. A non-zero number, fact. correct, in Pennsylvania, a non-zero number. But for whatever reason, um, Rudy Giuliani, I assume, and and uh, the elite strike force, as they term themselves, Jenna Ellis, uh, Sidney Powell, and um, Rudy Giuliani, they put a lot of stock in that argument. And it ultimately led to a federal court case in Pennsylvania in which one set of lawyers withdrew, were replaced by another set of lawyers. Those lawyers withdrew. <laughs> one of those lawyers actually was the judge wouldn't let withdraw. <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hey, how does that work? So I, I think the I think the, <laughs> I think the judge like so there was a set of lawyers who like brought the case. And then there was like a revised version of it, which looked like Giuliani and Ellis or whoever, like basically forced to be rewritten. So the first set of lawyers withdrew. Then the second set of lawyers, I think, must have not been comfortable with. I, I don't I don't know why they withdrew, but they they withdrew. Giuliani then announced he was going to argue the case in Pennsylvania Federal District Court. So those lawyers tried withdrew, and one of them was not allowed to withdraw. She was actually the lawyer in Pennsylvania. The out-of-state lawyers were allowed to withdraw, so she actually had to attend this hearing with uh, with Giuliani. But but how can a judge force a lawyer to argue in case they want to withdraw? The, ju the judge's <laughs> I mean position, I think, was it's too close to the hearing. Like there's been too many changes, and I and. And like you brought this case on an emergency basis and like, I'm not going to let there be a delay because like a new lawyer is involved. So I'm going to keep the old lawyer in the case. He eventually let her drop out after Giuliani argued the case. I assume he wanted her in the case so that Giuliani couldn't show up and be like, we need more time. So here's the thing. I, and you know this, Al, because, uh, you know, you and I worked 
together closely on a post-election case. I am always very circumspect about criticizing the lawyers on the other side because, you know, we all make decisions, litigation decisions, and sometimes they work out and sometimes they don't work out. It's very easy in retrospect for people to say, well, that was a really dumb decision that Elias made um, here or there. So I'm very circumspect about criticizing the lawyers on the other side. But I, I can say this, Rudy Giuliani is not a good courtroom lawyer. Like he is not the strike force leadership. Well, at least we got a we got a real scoop here. Yeah, um, and he didn't, do, <laughs> he, he didn't have a good case, but um, I think that his performance will probably mark the moment at which pretty much everyone recognized the media, the Republicans, you know, <laughs> that there was no there there. There's such a thing as strict scrutiny, which is, you know, typically what, if you're in his shoes arguing that there's a fundamental constitutional right, what you say is, you know, the right to vote or the right to observe in his case is a fundamental constitutional right, although it's not a fundamental constitutional right to observe vote counting in close proximity during a pandemic. But in any event, he was arguing that that, that, that was a, a constitutional right. So normally, if you're arguing a constitutional right, what you say is that restrictions on that right are subject to strict scrutiny, right? Which means that the state can't deny that right without a really good reason. That's a fundamental right. So he's asked by the judge, you know, or, 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 you know, what level of scrutiny are you saying should apply here? And he clearly didn't know what the question meant. So he said the usual. <laughs> like, oh God, you know, like, like, and so the judge was trying out well, like strict scrutiny, like scrutiny. Said, nah, you know, it's just the usual scrutiny. And the judge was taken aback, like, well, you know, normally, Mr. Giuliani, you know, you would want strict scrutiny to apply because you know of this. Yeah, I want more of those stories. Mark. <laughs> yeah, uh, read the transcript of Rudy's uh, appearance. Uh, he was asked if if they were pleading fraud, right? Because after all, you know, they were claiming out on the sidewalk that this was all a big fraud. And yet in the courtrooms, as you point out, the, the lawyers were backing away from that. So the federal judge very soberly asked Rudy Giuliani, are you claiming that there was fraud? Is your complaint that there was fraud? And Rudy Giuliani said, absolutely, this was fraud. The judge then said, well, but... If you plead fraud, aren't you subject to the federal rules of civil procedures requirement that you plead fraud with specificity? So it turns out there's a special rule in the <laughs> rule of civil procedure that if you claim fraud, you have to plead it with particularity, that you have to say who, when, what, how. It has to be very detailed. And you didn't do that. And which point Rudy Giuliani said, okay, no, 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 we're not pleading fraud. We're not pleading that fraud. <laughs> like we're, we're not pleading, we're not pleading kind of fraud in the legal sense. We're, so it was, it really was the moment, that hearing where I think we knew there wasn't a legal or factual basis for these lawsuits, but it was at that point that it became clear that in some measure, you know, they were kind of making this up as as they went along, and that and I give, that was pretty apparent. It was, and I give a lot frankly. of credit to a lawyer named Mark Aronchak, who was the lawyer for some of the counties in that case, and he basically just like when it came his time to speak, you know, he just basically just like called it out. He's like, "This is a disgrace." He said, "This is a disgrace." Like what you're seeing here is just a disgrace. <laughs> and I, I give Mark, I, who you know, I, I know in by reputation, I give him a lot of credit for really um, speaking out clearly about that. I would say the other turning point in all of this is that after that Pennsylvania debacle, where the judge just uh, eviscerated them in his decision, saying basically like, "I can't believe you brought this case to me." Is that the uh, thirty-four page? Or something like that. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and it was, yes, it was pretty scathing. It's very scathing. And by a judge who, by the way, former member of the Federal Society, uh, active in, when he was in private practice, active in the NRA, active in Republican Party politics. This was not a liberal judge. I mean, he was a fair judge. This was a guy Toomey negotiated for by using his blue slip. Correct. That's exactly right. It, it, and it's the reason why after this judge ruled, Toomey actually came out and defended the judge and said, this is a fair judge and this is what the judge found. It was after that that the Rudy Giuliani and Jenna Ellis and Sidney Powell did their press conference um, with the hair dye. And Powell went so far off the rails, I assume, that it's the reason why, if you remember, within 24 or 48 hours, President Trump announced 
to all of her surprise that Cindy Powell actually wasn't part of his legal team, uh, notwithstanding the fact that he, she was standing in the Republican Party headquarters with the rest of the elite strike force uh, team. And, you know, she then spearheaded four cases, one in Georgia, one in uh, Wisconsin, one in Michigan, and one in Arizona, which she referred to, and then other people jokingly referred to as the Kraken lawsuits, because she said that before these were filed, that she was going to unleash the Kraken, which um, when I Googled was a reference to a mythological octopus-like monster creature. I'm not sure I still understand the connection between that and voting, but it was a uh, sort of a wild-eyed conspiracy theory. It was amazingly weird and wild-eyed. But I think Ron Johnson maybe believed some of it. Uh, so it or... seems to be the case. <laughs> he held a hearing in which he uh, in which he did seem to give some credence, which is really, really unfortunate because, you know, the cases he highlighted in that hearing were all heard by judges and dismissed. You know, the Nevada case that he heard from the lawyer, he heard from the lawyer from the Nevada case, which was dismissed by a trial judge and unanimously rejected by the state Supreme Court. The case in... But that was just on procedural matters. No, that wasn't. That was actually on them. the merits. That was actually... On I know, but I know, but that's what they're... That's what, what, didn't one of their witnesses say that? Yes. So, in the hearing? <laughs> so, so, look, it is true that a large number of their cases were so mispled that they were dismissed on procedural grounds. That is absolutely true. Okay? Like, they just weren't, you know, they were procedurally improper. For example, the state of Texas suing four other states was, you know, procedurally improper. But it's interesting that in a number of cases, including in Nevada, um, including in Arizona, where the case was heard on the merits and affirmed by a unanimous Supreme Court in Arizona, which is also quite a conservative Supreme Court. And also, interestingly, in federal district court in Wisconsin, where the judge made a point of saying that he was not going to dismiss the case on procedural grounds. He actually was going to find that it was procedurally proper to bring. And then he went about dismantling it on the, on the merits and made a specific point of saying, this is a decision on the merits of the lawsuit, not procedural. On the merits, this case is not supported by fact or by law. And that was Wisconsin. And it's funny because Ron Johnson's from Wisconsin. So you think he would have known that? Yes. And by, again, a, a judge uh, with a conservative pedigree and a conservative bent appointed by a, by a Republican president. So I'm not saying that, you know, who appoints the president is always the answer or, but it's- Well, now it is. Well, but it's interesting Almost. how many <laughs> judges appointed by Donald Trump himself ruled against him. And one of the un- told stories of this because it's very wonkish is how it looks like in many instances conservative judges went out of their way to be the ones writing the decisions you look at the third circuit decision that ruled against them what was that one what was the what so was that you one? look at the, the the giuliani the case that went up from giuliani the pennsylvania case that went up to the third circuit it was written by a prominent Republican, Trump-appointed judge. You look at the case from Georgia that went up to the 11th Circuit. The decision, you know, uh, uh, my recollection was written by William Pryor, who's the chief judge of the court, but also the most conservative judge on the 11th Circuit. Famously. Famously, yeah, famously conservative. You know who he is. Like, you know, and and so it, it almost felt like the judiciary was trying to send a clear sign that they were not going to let these cases be criticized as as by liberals, which is the reason why the Trump line now is not that they were liberal judges, but that the judges dismissed them on procedural grounds. Even though they didn't. No, in many instances, they didn't. They didn't. <laughs> no. I mean, the Wisconsin Supreme Court, the case that the Wisconsin Supreme Court decided a few days ago, that was after a trial. You know, there was a, a hearing, a merits hearing, um, and that was uh, uh, that was affirmed by the Wisconsin Supreme Court, more to, more of a divided court, but affirmed by the Wisconsin Supreme Court uh, after a, a merits hearing. Boy, the damage that this has done. And I know I've seen you a number of times on, on the, the television uh, talk about really what a Shonda this is. For our democracy. I mean, what was it? 126 House members signed on the Texas case and 18 uh, Republican attorneys general? Yeah. And look, 
in some respects, I understand what Ken Paxton was doing, right? The Republican Attorney General in Texas. He's got an open criminal investigation, presumably, you know, maybe fishing for a pardon. And what better way? To- it's a, it, it, he has an investigation, not that he's conducting. He's being uh, correct. Investigation. Correct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so make that clear. Right. So you know, you, you know. figure, all right, <laughs> if you're trying to curry favor, you know, in, in the Trump crony world, what better way than to, you know, do this? Yeah, you, you have to excuse him. Yes, you have to excuse him. But like, what the excuse <laughs> for the other seventeen attorneys general? I mean, presumably they didn't need a pardon. Right. I mean, as far as I know, none of them needed a pardon. So, like, what's their excuse for trying to throw out the votes of four states in what was clearly a futile effort? Like, it wasn't going to win. So they're lending their name for all of history. They're putting their state's reputation on the line of taking the position that Georgians shouldn't be allowed to elect, (laughs) shouldn't have their votes count. And then on top of that, the House Republicans, like, they're not even the attorney generals of the state. Like, they, they just are like, Hey, Supreme Court, we're here because we just think it's really important that we shamelessly shill for Donald Trump and, you know, sign our names to a effort to undermine the U.S. electoral system. Like, that's all we're here for. We had no other value to this other than to tarnish democracy. And so I am, I hold them in the most contempt. Yeah, well, we were talking last night about profiles and courage and what Kennedy, you told me what JFK said before the book came out, but what he really discovered, what all these profiles and courage sort of had in common. The thing about profiles and courage as a book is, you know, it talks about eight senators who had demonstrated extraordinary courage. And he wrote a piece for New York Times Magazine in the, in the December before the book gets published. The book is published in um, in January, in which he is sort of explaining if profiles and courage is the who and the what. This article is the why. It's why do politicians display courage? And he talks about all the cross currents that politicians have: constituents, partisan considerations, electoral considerations. And what he ultimately concludes is that. The senators or politicians who display courage are more often than not not doing it out of love of country, but rather they're doing it out of love of self because they have actually a lot of self-respect. And they therefore would rather be criticized for their positions than for not being self-respecting. And it's an interesting way of thinking about political courage because in some respects then Paxton was acting out of self-preservation. Not that he was courageous, but he was acting out of self-preservation. But the ultimate cowardice in politics is not when people act in their self-interest, but when people don't have enough self-respect to even stand up for their own image. Like, you know, like Ted Cruz, right? Whose like wife is called ugly by Donald Trump and then becomes obsequious towards Trump. Like in some ways that's more despicable than even what you what you saw from from Paxton, who was just, you know, fishing for a pardon. I, I had a back and forth texting with a former colleague of mine, Republican colleague, started about 10 days after Biden was declared the winner. And I, I kind of went to him, hey, um, don't you think you should say something? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know uh, this is about, you know, our democracy and more and more people are now more and more Republican voters seem to be doubting it because this is continuing and shouldn't you guys say something? Shouldn't you say something? And it was a very, very disappointing back and forth with someone who I liked. So therefore we know it wasn't Ted Cruz. Well, as I have said that I (laughs) like Ted Cruz more than almost any of my colleagues and I hated Ted Cruz. <laughs> but what's interesting about Ted Cruz in all of this mm-hmm. is so one of the you were asking about like the 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 highlights or the lowlights. So one of the most bizarre episodes in this was a lawsuit that was filed very late in the process by Congressman Mike Kelly of Pennsylvania, who was just elected, right? Because he's a congressman. So he just won his reelection, who sued 
Pennsylvania to block the certification of any election in Pennsylvania, including presumably his own. Well, a lot of the a lot of the uh, House members who signed the Amicus brief uh, were were in the same boat, right? Yeah, yeah. So he filed this lawsuit, and you know, and he lost in the state supreme court. <laughs> shockingly, <laughs> shockingly, this did this this theory of his didn't prevail, and so he decides to seek emergency injunctive relief in the U.S. Supreme Court. So they file an application for emergency relief in the U.S. Supreme Court. Let's be clear, there was no chance the U.S. Supreme Court was going to grant emergency relief here. And then Ted Cruz, out of nowhere, tweets out, and I think releases a video, saying, I have agreed to argue this case (laughs) (laughs) in the U.S. Supreme Court. And I'm sitting there thinking... What on earth are you talking about? First of all, there is no oral argument on an emergency application. (laughs) So I tweet that. I like literally tweet back at him. I'm like, like I'm I'm thinking he went to Harvard Law School. Like he's like he isn't he a real lawyer? Like didn't he practice law? He was Solicitor General of Texas, and he argued before the Supreme Court. Yeah, so I'm thinking like, what on earth? But he just kind of like volunteered this. I'm thinking. It's like that I have offered, I have offered like this magnanimous moment. I have offered to argue this in the U.S. Supreme Court. And so that was weird. Like it was just a weird place where Ted Cruz all of a sudden like popped up. It, this is like the Trump team was like, it's like a football game where starting at the first play of the game, every play was a Hail Mary. Here's the question that I have, and it's an open question that maybe someday we'll know the answer. So before the election day, there were lots of articles about how the Trump campaign had armies of lawyers, 50,000 poll observers, a lot of very prominent conservative Republican law firms, you know, had been plotting this out for months and months and months. And if you remember on the left, there was a lot of anxiety that that there was this very well orchestrated plan that was going to be executed after election. And well financed. Well, finance, all of that. Mm -hmm. And then immediately after the election, you kind of have two things that happen simultaneously. One is they are like bringing these tiny cases, like the one I mentioned about the one victory they had, right? Like, so on the one hand, they're bringing cases that like don't affect much of anything. And then on the other hand, they're they're bringing these Hail Mary passes. And so what I don't know, um, and I don't think, you know, you or I can know, but I'm eager at some point to find out is what was actually the plan? Like this can't have been the plan. (laughs) Like, did they actually have a plan and like just really really came and blew it up, which is, which is part of what, you know, you hear, you know, you read in the, in, you know, in the press is that, there were kind of these factions and Giuliani came in and like basically blew everything up. Okay. So uh, just any other highlights? I just want to get some really ridiculous stuff. I mean, obviously we can go to Sidney Powell. I mean, what she was charging at, at, at a certain point was Hugo Chavez uh, somehow uh, yes. was involved in all of this. So the, the heart of the Kraken conspiracy. <laughs> oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> involves false and malicious claims against Dominion voting uh, technology. I want to be clear that these are these are ridiculous and not true. But the allegation seems to be that Hugo Chavez, who I, I, I think has been dead for some time now, but that he entered into a illicit agreement with Dominion voting technology to be able to allow for the manipulated results that would later be deployed in the 2020 presidential election. And that, at least in Georgia, Brian Kemp was sort of in on it. Okay. Which seems unlikely. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, just like as conspiracy theories go, that one, like, I, it, 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 never, it never really hung together for me. I mean, I was waiting for kind of like the Hillary Clinton angle, but, but it, took a veer, it took a turn to like Brian Kemp and that's where just you know, for everybody I, who doesn't, yeah, you know, it's the governor, uh, the Republican, the Republican governor. governor, who used to be the Republican Secretary of State. So the reason why Brian Kemp gets dragged into this is because he was the Republican Secretary of State of Georgia when the voting machines made by Dominion were bought and purchased by the state of 
of Georgia. So the allegation was, again, false allegation, not true, totally spurious. And I never have nice things to say about Brian Kemp, but like it, this crazy theory at the time of Brian Kemp. Yeah, he was awful as Secretary of State. I mean, he, yeah. <laughs> Terrible Secretary of State. Just, just completely did the playbook of voter suppression. Absolutely. Yeah. He was a voter suppression guy through and through. But not even I think that he was in on a conspiracy with Hugo Chavez <laughs> to plant bogus voting machines in his state so that Joe Biden could win the election. Uh, yes. And then, you know, and then, you know, there's a, there's a side note to all of this. So they had a couple of experts that they were relying on. One was a guy named Spider, uh, which is a code name for someone who everyone knows who it is. In fact, his name has been published in the Washington Post, but which to this day, Sidney Powell still says is a super secret thing. He's like an IT guy <laughs> who, who wrote this paper that like, you know, lays out CIA, like all this, all this, all of this, you know, stuff. Um, but then there's another guy who they rely on, who's, uh, who supposedly did an analysis of voting returns in Michigan that showed, you know, impossible results, showed that like basically if you looked at the results of the data that he had from 2020 and you compared it to 2016 and 2018, it was impossible. The problem is that he he didn't get the fact that MN was Minnesota, not Michigan. So his analysis of the data was of counties and towns in Minnesota. Okay, uh, making that it would seem to me invalid. Yeah, yeah, you know, you think so. So he was comparing Michigan results in 2016 with Minnesota results in 2020, and he kind of proved that uh, they that, were the, that they didn't match up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this this was the level of this whole thing, and. It it is just a disgrace. Yeah, there was one of their experts. I can't remember which one who who placed a lot of emphasis on the results in Edison County, Georgia. There is no Edison County, Georgia. <laughs> in fact, I learned something very interesting to me, which would I would not have guessed. There is no Edison County anywhere in America. Not even in New Jersey. Not even in New Jersey. It's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it is, uh, and and this all gets to something I've been saying, which is there's just two universes of information now, and if you have 75% of Republican voters now believing that this was fraudulent, this victory, the, the, I, I don't know how you how you bring Americans together at all. It's impossible. And these guys, yeah. these yeah. guys really, this was a key moment. This was a key moment in time after Biden was declared. All the networks, including Fox, said he'd won, and it's clear he won. Look, you did my recount. I was down by 700 and something votes, and we did a, a hand recount of every ballot, 2.9 million ballots, curing ballots that had been rejected for one reason or another, every ballot was looked at. I won by 312 votes. It was a swing of just over 1,000 votes. Georgia was more than 12,000, and that just isn't going to happen. Now, look, what sh what's shameful about this episode is, you know, I never begrudged them their recount in Georgia. You know, they wanted a recount. Um, I thought it was a waste. I didn't think it was going to change well, didn't, anything. Didn't the, uh, the Secretary of State there actually proactively go like, okay, let's do a recount. Yeah. The Secretary of State said, let's do a hand recount. You know, my view was the law didn't entitle them to that. We didn't challenge it. We didn't, you know, we, we didn't begrudge them. I was that. happy they were doing it. Yeah. And, and yet after that, then they asked for a machine recount. Okay. Kind of a waste of money, kind of a waste of time, but they did that. The, the recounts are not what I, I think was so shameful here. What was shameful was the effort to mislead people, number one, that the claims you were making in the parking lot were the same claims you were making in the courtroom. Number two, that those claims had merit. And now there is this effort afoot 
to suggest that somehow, even though the courts heard all these cases and claims, they're still true. And I, I just, I think that, you know, democracy is a very fragile thing and it, re, it, it depends not just on laws, but on norms. And I didn't expect Donald Trump to follow the norms. I did expect U.S. senators and members of Congress and attorneys generals to follow those norms. I thought that they would have enough personal conviction in their own sense of of self as people who have participated in democratic elections to defend the process of free and fair elections and peaceful transfer of power and their unwillingness to do that and both the active undermining it by people like the 126 republican members of congress but even the the appalling silence to to use a phrase uh, that uh, dr king used even the appalling silence of some of the others is really, really distressing for the future of democracy in our country. The appalling silence of almost all of them. At, at you know, one point not so long ago, there were more Republicans in Congress who got COVID than who had recognized that Biden had won. And this was many weeks after the election. It's a disgrace. And it, it, it really jeopardizes everything, our whole entire system that people fought and died for for over 200 years. It's shameful and it, it's sickening and it makes me just both angry but also just really profoundly sad. Yeah. And, you know, the Russians interfered in 16. I don't think they thought... Hillary would lose. I think they thought Hillary would win, but they wanted kind of to, they just wanted to cast doubt on our system and give Americans less confidence in our system. And boy, Trump has done that beyond the Russians' wildest dreams. Yes. But again, I, I'm not going easy on Trump, but Senator McConnell and his conference had an opportunity to say enough is enough. And they didn't. And they didn't during his presidency, and now they didn't do it after the election. And I think that has actually had a more corrosive effect. I think, I think maybe I'm wrong about this, but I think if Donald Trump had had behaved the way he did, but on November, you know, twentieth, give him a few days, right? Give him a few weeks. On November twentieth, you know, Senator McConnell and Congressman McCarthy had issued a joint statement congratulating Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. I think that our democracy would be in a different place and, and public confidence would be in a different place. I, I completely agree. And this is why I was so shocked by my uh, texting back and forth with my former colleague. I mean, it, it was beyond, uh, it, it was just hard to take because it was it was kind of like, it was dishonest. Instead of just saying, look, our base is a Trump base. If I said something, I'd be primaried and lose. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, why not just say that? I mean, that's, right. you know, but instead it was like, well, you know, um, uh, recounts and audits are really good for to legitimize. I go, we've already had that. And Trump is saying uh, that the, those recounts are fraudulent and is saying and he's still saying it. So what you're saying doesn't apply here. And then he'd say the same thing over again. I go like, are you deliberately not like reading what I'm saying? It was really sad. And it, this is just sad. No, I totally agree with you. Trump is crazy. Trump is a psychotic. He is, he's a, a terrible, terrible, terrible person. And I think he's very, you know, damaged. These Republicans, there's got to be some that aren't damaged. And they, this is a disgrace. And no, 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 you're absolutely right. This was, yeah, Donald Trump's Donald Trump. You can't expect anything, anything from him. But man, oh man, that these uh, attorneys general signed the amicus brief, the 126 House members of me, and that the Republican senators didn't, okay, I, I wouldn't have given them 10 days, but I would have given them three days or something. That's what you do. That's what you do. It's, it's sad. It is. 
and the question of how do you um how do you go back from there and yeah i don't think you can get the toothpaste back in the tube that's the problem that's the question, right yep i uh, i just don't think you can and that is i think that's lasting damage and look if trump had won if trump had won i think it would be all over the democracy yeah i agree, I agree with that uh, and now that's more clear that's clearer than ever now and so uh this is frightening and thank you for um for helping maintain our democracy well thank you it's always good to talk to you um, <laughs> Wait, let's end up on a high uh, let's get back let's get back to fun fun on how funny it was all right so one last one last question that i have so so Sidney Powell files the Kraken lawsuits, right? We know mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And we know that they were, you know, riddled with typos, um, which, you know, um, including spelling like the names of the courts wrong, like as in the word district. They seem to struggle with how to spell district. <laughs> okay. It's a district court. The, you know what? I have spell check. <laughs> so, here, so here's my question for you. So you draft a lawsuit, which, you know, Hugo Chavez, right, conspiracy, all of that. And... And then you post it online and it's got typos on the cover page, including how you spell the word district as in district court. And like, I'm, like a lot of people pointed out, like not, this was not unnoticed. So then when you go to file it, don't you think you, you fix it before you then actually file it? But no, they actually filed the copy. Like, so that's one of my other questions is like, how did that happen? Right. So like, like they didn't catch the spell check to begin with, but then they didn't catch it even after it was pointed out. So they were like, like, Sydney, did you notice that uh, a lot of people were pointing out that we spelled district wrong? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've heard a lot about that. Yeah, we're going with it. though. OK, well, but we're <laughs> yeah. filing it. Oh, my Lord. Well, uh, uh, let's hope we win in Georgia. Yes. That's all I can say. Um, Same here. Uh, Mark, again, uh, thank you. I think you're, this may be your, your four Pete on, on, <laughs> on the podcast. And, but this one is, uh, is the capper. I mean, this is, uh, what a, what a, does that mean you're not going to have me back? Yes, that's what it means. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Then thank you. Thank you for, thank you for having me. Yes. So goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. <laughs>